Hello and welcome to today's ISF seminar as part of Keel Green Festival 2021. We're thrilled to be joined by Dr Helen Glanville for her seminar, Soils and Air Climate. After graduating with an MSCI in geology from Birmingham University, Helen worked in the oil and gas industry as a formation damage geologist for six months and then had a complete career change, moved to South Korea to work as an English teacher and after two years as a senior teacher, returned to the UK in 2008 to pursue a career in academia, studying for a PhD in soil biogeochemistry at Bangor University, where she looked at drivers controlling soil respiration in temperate grasslands and high Arctic tundra in Svalbard. Ellen was awarded the Draper's Company Bronze Medal in 2013 in recognition of her outstanding academic achievements and for providing pastoral support to her peers. Since completing her PhD, Helen has worked as a biogeochemist on two large NERC funded consortium projects between 2013 and 2017, both at Bangor University. And Helen's research explored critical thresholds controlling microbial pathways in terrestrial and aquatic environments to understand their role in larger scale global nutrient cycling processes. Helen joined the School of Geography, Geology and the Environment at Keele University as a lecturer in physical geography in 2017 where she's keen to develop new and exciting research ideas and continue to widen her research collaborations. Thank you, Helen, for joining us today. We're really looking forward to your seminar. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for the introduction, um, Sarah and Alana, for the invite to talking today about soils and our climate. Um, I should kind of point out that I might have gone a little bit rogue in what I'm going to talk about today because I wanted to kind of highlight just how important soils are. So rather than just kind of focusing on a particular aspect of my research, I wanted to give people an overview of just how amazing soils are. Um, and I particularly love this quote um, that I've kind of, you can see hopefully on the screen here, that's about soils are a library um, and they hold records of the Earth's past and the possibilities of its future sustainability. Um, so I think I, I took kind of, um, inspiration from this as to how to, to direct this talk. So just to kind of give you a bit of overview as to what I'm going to kind of talk about, um, I thought we'd do a little journey through time in terms of looking at soils and climate change in particular. Um, and so to do that, we need to go back in time to try and understand a little bit more about soil history. Um, and then that leads is into talking a little bit about soil formation um, and some of the important factors that are involved in that. Um, then I want to talk to you about the distribution of soils around the world, just so we can get a flavour of how diverse our amazing world beneath our feet actually is. Um, and then I can't possibly do a talk without talking about the interactions with people. Um, and so this particular component of the talk will be about with people, meeting climates and how soils kind of all interact there. Um, then I'll do a little bit about soils under threat um, and then focus on soils as a potential solution. Um, and then leading on to future sustainability. So it's quite a lot to, to get through, but again, we're going to cover 400 million years of uh, geological time through soils in like 30 minutes. So bear with me. So like I said, in, for us to actually try and understand the future, we need to go back in time a little bit to try and understand about how our soils evolved, how resilient our soils potentially might be. Um, and so I was going to do a little Mentimeter quiz, but I'm glad I didn't, given the numbers that we've got on here. Um, but thinking about when our very first complex terrestrial ecosystems established. Um, and so some of the oldest terrestrial plant fossils go back to about 470 million years ago. Um, and some of these, they were not necessarily kind of vascularized plants, um, but they are just some of the oldest ones that have been recorded. The first evidence of fossilised stems and roots um, go back to 430 million years ago. Um, these weren't necessarily deeply rooted. Um, the soils at the time were still rather unconsolidated and so were very, very easily eroded. And there was very, very little organic matter accumulation happening. So once we get into the early Devonian, so this is about 416 million years ago, this is where we see a rapid diversification of our vascularized plants. Um, and so this has then major implications for actually sustaining life on land, because before then there was only potentially some kind of lichens, some mosses, um, and very little life was able to be sustained. 
So then when we get into the Devonian period, um, we actually see this massive shift. And so we know that soils and forest ecosystems have basically been co-evolving for over 400 million years. And that's despite going through major climatic shifts, massive extinction events, major geological events as well. Um, but the soils and the forests have still maintained um, and formed this kind of biomantle that we see over the Earth's surface. And this is very heavily evidenced in the fossil record. Um, and so you can see the pictures, hope you can see my cursor. Um, we've got Arodoptis um, plants. This is like a fossilized fern um, that's found one of the oldest um, fossilized vascular, vascularized plant species. Um, and then the top picture um, is actually a paleosol. Um, and this is um, found on Anglesey. So if any of you have ever been to Anglesey, Anglesey is known as a, a geopark. So it has the same geological status as the um, Devonian red sandstone down south. Um, but probably less people know about the Anglesey one. And what you can see here, so the little yellow bits that you can see on the picture are actual forms of burial sites, potentially from worms that may have kind of burrowed down through the soils um, or ancient root systems. And these have been fossilized and preserved over a long period of time. And this is what we would call a paleosol. So once we kind of get into the Devonian, then we know that there's been this rapid appearance of many, many plants. And so if you're interested in this, then have a look at the Devonian explosion and you will see just the rapid increase in terms of terrestrial life. Um, and especially in relating to, to soils, um, during this time period, we saw that the Earth's crust became or came under biological control. So this led to a reduction in surface erosion and um, led to the soil formation and then led to diversification um, of everything, basically, of life within the soil and life above ground. Um, and this is really nicely highlighted in this top image here. Um, sorry, the, uh, the reference is hidden. Oh, no, it's not. It's at the top. I moved it. There we go. Um, so what you can see here is the geological time period on this left hand side. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we've got the key kind of events in the evolution of terrestrial plants. And so the period of time that we're interested in is this Silurian Devonian um, kind of time period or epoch. So you can see this is where we first start to see terrestrial plants and um, wood and in particular forests. Um, and so linked to that is this particular column that I want you to kind of have a look at. And so you can see this is relating to carbon sequestration and relating to carbon burial. So you can see before this period, it's relatively low. Um, and that's because of those conditions not being suitable in terms of organic matter accumulation um, and any soil that was formed was very easily eroded. However, once you start to see this increase in the um, of plant diversity um, coming in, then you can see that we get a massive increase in carbon burial and carbon storage. Um, and that's really important and it continues all the way up throughout kind of geological time. So it highlights, you know, what we can look at in terms of carbon sequestration throughout the past um, and how it's key and critical to not only to soil formation, but also for storing carbon. So that kind of leads me on a little bit then to, to kind of how soil is formed. So we know from what I've just said that biology plays a big role um, in terms of that. Um, but we also have other kind of four main factors. So we've got biology or organisms in this case, but we also have the parent material. We also have topography. Obviously, this talk is mostly about climate, um, but then we also have time that are all playing a role in the, how soils are formed. Although it's not that straightforward, um, soils are very, very complicated, which makes them really interesting to study, but also really, really challenging to study at the same time. So within our soils, we have lots of different processes that are happening. I'm not going to focus on these today because, again, like I said, I wanted to give you this broad overview about just how amazing soils are. Um, then we also kind of then can link it into to soil profiles um, and then actually what's in that soil profile. So a lot of people are interested probably in carbon storage. So where within the soil profile can we store that and what can we actually do to our soils? Um, and then linked across here, we've got soils are just fundamental to every single landscape that we know um, are across the globe. Um, so they are fundamentally important to, to everything that we do. Um, but again, I'll talk about this in the next couple of slides about how diverse 
our world soils are. And this is due to this combination of these five different factors all playing a role in our different soils. And we know, I mean, I've, I've gone through kind of geological time, um, so we know that we're going back, you know, millions of years, but the formation of soil is a very long and complex process as well. Um, and so this diagram here highlights, you know, just to get one centimetre of soil to form can take up to a thousand years. OK, so that's something to kind of bear in mind when we're talking about potential threats and challenges to our world soils um, and bearing in mind all these different factors that go into how soils are formed, which also then play a role in these different processes within the soil profile itself. Um, and I love these schematics. So the, the FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, um, they produce some really fantastic resources for soils. I'll use a couple of them later on as well. Um, but if you're interested, take a look at their website. There's lots of really good infographics there. So that leads me on to what we mean in terms of the diversification or the classifications of soils around the world. Um, again, this is actually quite complicated because there are different systems depending on where you are in the world. Um, why have one system when you can have several? Um, and so this kind of came about um, in order to try and ascertain what our global kind of soil resources and reserves are, um, there needs to be some kind of global system in which we can actually try and um, quantify all these things. Um, and so this kind of came about, yeah, um, so this kind of came about, I think it was about, I can't remember when it was now, anyway, I'll move on from that. Um, but here we can identify that we've got 32 different world soil types, and this is based on the World Reference Database for Soils. Um, you might also see, if you look at the American system, they refer to soils by orders, so they have 12 different soil orders which do fit into these different um, world soil reference types as well. Um, but again, it makes it very confusing when you're actually looking at the literature because some people switch from, from one or the other. Um, and the idea of the world reference soil database is that there is one, yeah, one classification system around the world. Um, but what you can see, you know, we've got 32 different world soil types. Um, and that's the reflection of the different climatic regimes and all those other different factors of soil formation that play a role. Um, so I'm not expecting you to remember all the names of them, but again, just look at the different diversity in terms of the colours all around the globe in terms of our soils. So then I thought I'd focus in a little bit on Europe, um, so things that you might be more familiar with. And so Europe actually has about 80% of the global range of different soil types. Um, and again, you can see here on this kind of coloured map, um, which highlights those. So it has yeah, 24 of these reference soil groups that are identified within Europe. And again, if you're interested in having a look more specifically at these different soils, then please have a look at the Soil Atlas of Europe. It's a free resource um, and it's got some, you know, again, fantastic images. There's, you know, hundreds of pages going through all the different soil types um, found within Europe. And interestingly, what they've done in terms of the um, European soil types is then they characterise them based on um, key characteristics. Um, and as you can see here, just looking at the pie chart, so, you know, we've got different types of soils based on characteristics. So you might have organic soils, ones defined by parent material. Remember, that's another important soil forming factor. And um, those defined by topography. So again, another um, factor of soil formation. Those that are young or rejuvenated, so again, linking in time. Um, and then what we've got here is pretty much, I don't know, I'd say 35% maybe of the pie chart is related to climate um, and how important climate is, specifically in a UK, uh, in a European, sorry, context of the different types of soils that we might find. Um, and this kind of schematic on the right hand side, hopefully I'm not blocking the image, I can, I've kind of blocked myself off with the, the team's image at the bottom. Um, but this highlights, again, the importance of climate um, in the different types of soil landscapes that we might find. So you can see that we have at the top here, we've got precipitation. Um, and so this is a relatively high level of precipitation in the tropics, all the way across to the north in the Arctic, where we have low levels of precipitation. Um, and you can see quite clearly in this diagram in the middle that we've got differences in the amount of soil that can form in these different landscapes, okay, which is heavily linked to the climate in terms of precipitation and in terms of temperature. 
Um, and this graph underneath just highlights that nicely. So when we've got high temperatures, high water contents, we're going to get deep kind of soils forming. OK, and then when we get into desert conditions, um, the temperature is still very, very high, but we've got very, very low precipitation. And again, that is reflected in the low amounts of organic matter accumulation that you might find within those soils. And then we get into more kind of temperate systems that you might be more familiar with in the UK. Um, and then we go into the Arctic again, where this time you've got temperature and precipitation that's both a limiting factor. So it just highlights how important climate is as a driver for the soil distribution all around the world. So then I thought, right, well, we've gone from global, we've gone from Europe, so let's go and have a look at the UK. So UK soils are probably about 10,000-ish years old. Um, and they have formed as a result of glacial retreat. Um, and this diagram just highlights, again, how important it is in terms of soil formation and what kind of happens in terms of how we actually get our soils that we see all around us today. Um, so again, when we start, it's very similar in terms of what we spoke about in terms of the Devonian and the geological periods, that initially there's very, very little soil accumulation. Um, but then what we see is this domination from microorganisms, the microorganisms will come in um, and algae. Um, then when we've got some more kind of accumulation, maybe from windblown deposits as well, as well as the glacial um, ice retreating itself, that we get these larger silt and clay fractions starting to accumulate. And this provides a nice kind of thin organic surface from which then pioneer species can start to colonise. And so we see again a shift between kind of primarily mechanical and chemical weathering through into this more kind of biological um, enhanced weathering that comes in. And once you've got the accumulation of some of these pioneer species, such as lichens and mosses, then that provides that organic layer, which then other um, deeper rooting species can then start to, to colonize and take over. And then all of those different combinations lead to the profile being formed that you might be more kind of familiar with here. OK, and we see these distinctive layers which will be associated um, with time, with inputs from um, different vegetation species, as well as then the impact of the biological weathering that's happening. OK, um, and obviously the red line on the bottom is time since deglaciation. So that's something to kind of bear in mind when we're thinking about our UK soils. That you know, the grand scheme of things in geological time frames, our soils are relatively young. Um, and so it doesn't mean to say that our soils are any less diverse. So this map, um, I've kind of cobbled together two together, so hopefully you can't see my jigsaw um, attempts. Um, so we've got 13 um, reference soil groups that are found in the UK. So remember that we've got 32 global ones, um, but within the UK itself, we have 13 different types. Um, of soils and all of those will have different properties um, relating to different kind of soil functions relating to different ecosystem services um, but you can see that you know just in a small island how unbelievably diverse our soils are so just to kind of you know highlight points like subliminal messaging throughout um, soils are epic soils are absolutely fantastic so over you know 400 million years soils have been around they've been co-evolving with with forests with different vegetation species okay and then we've got all those different factors that all kind of come into play um, for highlighting again just how important our soils are um, and so you know one of my favorite analogies is if you've got a handful of soil in your hand you have more organisms in your hands than you do people on the planet but again because it's invisible doesn't people don't tend to kind of see soil as something that's really cool and really exciting. But this image at the top just highlights some of the creatures that you might find in soils. Obviously, you're more familiar with earthworms and potentially moles. Um, but we've got a, a vast array of different microbes, of different fungi. We've got tardigrades that can survive, you know, extreme t temperatures, extreme pressures. Um, you know, they've been able to isolate the specific gene that helps protect these tardigrades and they're looking at whether they can use that in human cells to protect them from things like radiation and chemotherapy, for example. Um, you know, there's so many cool things that we can get from our soils in terms of medicinal properties. And, you know, soils have actually been responsible for winning um, two Nobel Prizes as well um, from the, the amazing things that we find in our soils. 
as I mentioned, you know, soils are, you know, they are absolutely incredible, but they take a long time to form. Soil is not just dirt, you know, soil is actually a good mixture. We've got mineral material, we've got water in there, we've got air and we've got organic material. OK, and it's this fine balance between all of those different components that give us our different soils. Um, and also sometimes in terms of the potential challenges and threats that our soils face, it changes these compositions. Um, again, in terms of kind of carbon cycling, um, all of these different soils around the world have different amounts of carbon that they can store. And it's not saying that one of these is better than the other. You know, you look at boreal moist forests, they can store a lot of carbon. But that doesn't mean to say that they're more important than polar dry regions. OK, they all serve a different purpose. Um, and it, it took me ages to actually find this diagram, but I'm um, glad I kind of persevered to have a look. Because a lot of people kind of tend to focus, because it's what they can see, on the above ground biomass. But actually, if you look in terms of carbon sequestration, it's potentially more important that we look below ground um, and look at how much carbon we can actually store beneath our feet. And obviously, we know that soils are fundamental for, for growth and for plant growth, both in terms of kind of production, um, but also just in terms of the vast array of wonderful kind of um, vegetation species that we see. So that's kind of like a, a bit of a brief kind of first section talking about kind of the history or the geological history, if you like, of soils. But then obviously I can't talk about this without talking about people um, and the interactions then that people have with the soils and then that combination of people versus climate versus soils. Um, and again, this is a, another favourite quote of mine, that despite all of our achievements, we owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. You know, something so kind of simple, six inches really isn't very much, but yet we owe everything that we have today on that six inches of topsoil and that we have a bit of rain. So next time it rains, don't complain about it because it's really, really fundamental to supporting life itself. So again, you know, we're going to go take a little bit of a step back um, and we've had a really good relationship with our soils for over two million years, basically, from when the very first um, kind of human species, if you like, um, were around. You know, they lived off the land, these hunter gatherer societies, and they actively hunted for their food. They weren't sedentary. They were mobile. They moved around a lot. Um, and this kind of led to this notion of something called a paleo diet. I don't know if any of you kind of follow different diets, um, but this is one that the paleo, yeah, was where the paleo diet kind of come from um, for things about kind of, yeah, different grasses, different tubers, fruits, seeds and nuts. Um, and they developed a really good knowledge of plant life and growth cycles. Um, and some of the earliest pre preserved records um, are from 780,000 years ago in Israel, where they found different, 55 different food plant taxa um, around a, an area where there was um, a colonization of people. Um, and these are some of the kind of first records where they were able to find evidence of using fire um, to potentially cook food and use to preserve some of the food. Um, and where these areas were found were then heavily linked to good quality soils. Um, and that was linked to a good climate. So these regions at the time um, it had a kind of Mediterranean climate um, and where these particular hunter gatherers would live would be, you know, potentially near lakes, lake margins um, and their associated terrestrial habitats. Um, and again, there is this seasonal availability of food. So, again, if, the, if you've got good soils and you can grow things and you've got a good climate, then you're going to be, get, be able to get different food items that can thrive there. Um, so, yeah, this goes back to 780,000 years ago. Um, and then we kind of come forward in time to the Neolithic Revolution. So, again, about 12,000 years ago, this is where we started to see agricultural practices kind of coming in. Um, and this is where we start to see agrarian societies kind of forming. And this kind of led to the end of these kind of nomadic lifestyles and permanent settlements kind of came into play mostly because there was a reliable food source. So why move when you don't have to, effectively? Um, but that then came with, if people stayed in one place, then obviously those societies and civilizations are able to grow. Um, and crops and animals could then be farmed to be able to meet demand. 
um, and that led to a rapid increase in population. So about 10,000 million years ago, there's probably about seven, uh, sorry, 5 million people globally. Um, and today we've got 7.8 billion people. And obviously that's continuing to grow. Um, and some of these kind of early agricultural practices um, were developed in several centers kind of around the world. Um, there's some kind of examples there from Mesopotamia in the Middle East. Um, we've got through to China, then we've got um, Northern Africa and South America. Um, Europe was a little bit later to kind of um, get on board with this, if you like. So it was about seven and a half thousand years ago um, that they started to see kind of these more agrarian societies developed in Southern Europe. Um, and then in Northern Europe, it wasn't until 6,000 years ago. And so again, you know, we can think about, well, why were these societies able to develop? Um, and a lot of this, again, comes down to having this good combination of a good climate, you know, not too wet, not too dry, um, but then also kind of good soil so we can actually grow and provide for the growing populations. However, when you come with, you know, an increase in population and an increase in demand on the land, um, then we need to start to think about the impacts that that might have um, on our landscape that we might see. Um, and again, this has been, you know, sustainable soil management has been around for, for years and there's evidence of some of the first terracing happening um, in China, I think it was about 4,000 years ago. Um, again, to try and kind of manage the land better to prevent soil erosion um, and to kind of increase kind of water infiltration in certain areas to grow better crops or grow more crops. Um, however, that does come at a cost. So, you know, there are evidence of sustainability practices in the past, but there's also strong links to changes in land management um, practices in terms of soil erosion um, and unsustainable kind of agricultural practices. Um, and one of the biggest ones that you can see um, in this kind of diagram on the right hand side is deforestation and the conversion to agricultural land. So you can see going back to 1000 BC, just how green um, kind of Europe, most of Europe is here. Um, and then you kind of jump ahead. I mean, this is just up to, to AD 1850. You can see that there's been massive, massive shifts. Um, and again, that is removal of this natural native um, forested landscape. Um, and converting it to agricultural land. But this is coming because there's common trends with intensification. It's to maintain and fulfill these um, social, political and economic drivers. OK, and it's all very complex. Um, so, you know, if we want to have a growing population and sustain that, then we need to have the land, we need to have the food to be able to provide for them. Um, but what that does lead to is another common trend, unfortunately, in terms of soil erosion. Um, and this is a major, major threat to global agricultural sustainability. Um, obviously, it is linked to climate change in terms of increasing rainfall, increasing potential for, for soil erosion. Um, and some of the first phases of major soil erosion correspond to some of these first major land use changes at a global scale. So, you know, we've got evidence in the past of some poor land management choices have led to major kind of losses of topsoil. Um, and then we come into some of the links then with humans in the environment. Um, and, you know, there's some fascinating stories out there. Again, when I was researching for this, um, some really interesting books looking at collapse of different civilizations and why that is. Um, and the Mayans is one um, that is hugely complex. They still don't quite know what happened. Um, but there is some suggestions that it's related to climate change, that it was a huge drought. Um, other links are that they just basically, um, they were really good at bringing in new different agricultural practices. They were really, really evolved with looking at that. But then there's talk that actually they did too much on the land and then it led to um, severe soil erosion. Um, and then there's also kind of political um, aspects as well, that there are other civilizations nearby and other cities um, and where you've got different people or different communities of people together. Um, there was a lot of political unrest um, and lots of fighting kind of broke out. Um, so, again, there's lots of information out there. If anyone's interested, I can send you some papers um, for looking at what happened um, to these different civilizations. Um, and interestingly, when the Europeans invaded, um, they actually were expecting to find these amazing civilizations and they didn't find anything there. But what they found were just these amazing forests. Um, and so it's 
it shows that the soils can recover. Um, but then there's a lot of interest as to why people didn't return. If the soils did recover, then why didn't the people come back? Um, so that goes into a whole other um, kind of area of research as well. But it just kind of goes to show that the soils are still resilient if we look after them and give them time to recover. Um, and this uh, diagram at the bottom, um, this just highlights how we've had different um, land management practices in terms of agriculture um, over different time periods and, and the relative contribution to, to soil erosion throughout those times. Um, so you can see that, you know, starting off with the plough, um, kind of minimal amounts of uh, tillage erosion. Um, then we start to kind of get the increase in um, different mechanisation. So we start to see actually we're getting more tillage erosion coming off here. Um, and then we've got different intercropping methods. Um, and then actually, oh, sorry, the intercropping methods kind of come down here, which actually lowers and reduces some of that um, potential erosion. This was back in the 1950s. Um, and then we've got this mechanisation that comes into play um, and, you know, massive amounts of erosion caused by this. And now we're kind of in this period of, of no tillage as well in different ways in which we can manage our farms, farmlands in particular, um, to reduce soil erosion. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of see these different practices throughout time um, and, and to how things that we can do to our land, you know, things that we've done in the past. I know there's a lot of interest now for actually bringing back um, horse and plough. Um, a friend of mine works for the Forestry Commission um, and they're trialling out different ways of doing felling um, and logging using horses as well. Um, so again, you know, it's going back to some of these older practices, but is that sustainable in terms of meeting demand? So that's kind of, again, a little bit of a brief step back in time. So then we can kind of move forward to today. Um, and unfortunately, our soils are under threat from various different angles. Um, and the top three are population growth linked to economic growth um, and then climate change. So I didn't want to just focus on the climate. Um, I think it's really important that we talk about the population growth um, interlinked with climate change. Um, and importantly, with the population and economic growth, you know, that is then heavily related to land use and land cover change. Um, and then climate change, there is a large amount of uncertainty as to how that might impact on soil functioning. Um, and I really like these schematics here um, that just kind of highlight some of the main threats associated with different parts of the world um, in terms of, um, yeah, in terms of the different threats that they might face. I mean, if you focus in here on the United Kingdom, um, soil sealing and land take is one of the biggest ones. You know, we've got increasing amounts of urbanisation. Um, you know, even in people's gardens, people like to just put loads of paving down. Um, potentially decking um, and covering the soil and sealing the soil. Um, and that's, you know, that's not going to be good in terms of um, sustainability for our future soils. Um, then if you look at, you know, the second biggest threat, potentially salinization um, sodification. Um, then we go down here, we've got contamination. Again, closely will be linked to urbanization as well. Um, and then we've got organic carbon change. So again, this shift Potentially, if you've got increased urbanisation, you might have a shift between organic carbon that's being potentially sequestered through to inorganic carbon. Um, and so you can see that different parts of the world have different threats and different challenges. But one of the biggest ones in particular that we've, we've spoken about is erosion. Um, and again, that is heavily linked with climate and heavily linked with people. So, yeah, you can't have one necessarily without the other by the sounds of it. Um, so we've got really big kind of challenges on a global scale. And obviously then, you know, this is on a mass scale and just trying to kind of simplify these threats. But then if you hone in in particular on specific areas, then we've got kind of localised issues as well, which again is part of the challenge when we're trying to actually look at the future sustainability of our soils. Five minutes. How many? Oh. Five minutes to go. <laughs> right, right, I'll speed up or I'll just keep talking and we can people can email me with questions maybe um so again why should we actually care about these soil functions um and so these are some really important aspects of um soils and what soils can actually do for us again this comes from the FAO um and you can highlight here you know we've got some really really important ones in terms of you know this particular focus on climate regulation closely linked with flood regulation we've got habitats for organisms but interestingly, we've also got, you know, this kind of cultural heritage aspect as well. 
Um, so again, soils offer a broad, broad range um, of soil functions. But this then does link into major threats in terms of our biodiversity, which in, underpin our soil function. And this is a map, it's just based on risk areas. Um, and so this is identifying those potential places around the world that are at risk in terms of their soil biodiversity um, and those that might be more sensitive to risk. Um, however, this is, you know, this is all to be taken kind of not with a pinch of salt, but it needs to have further research going into it of actually having a full assessment of our global soil biodiversity, which, you know, there are a lot of projects that are happening at the minute. Um, but we need to kind of ascertain yeah, what is happening globally. Um, but only 1% of our soil biodiversity or bioorganisms can have actually been um, cultured. Um, the rest we rely on DNA technologies to actually be able to, to see what's in there. So again, only 1% that we know about, so what about the rest? So again, you know, then it follows on to, you know, have we actually reached a tipping point in terms of the sustainability of our agrarian societies? Um, you know, if we're going to have sustainable agriculture, it's all dependent on efficient use of our natural resources, be it, <clears throat> excuse me, soils and water. Um, to meet existing needs, crop production needs to increase at twice the rate of population growth. So, you know, just just kind of think about how much that actually is, you know, in terms of the population that's increasing. So how can we meet, you know, our global demands? You know, I, this all depends on our land use. It depends on how um, resilient our different land uses are to change. It then has knock on effects for our water use and potential water sources. Um, and then it also feeds into the ability of our agricultural land to produce crops. But yet, if we're having massive amounts that are being lost through to soil erosion and degradation, then have we got enough kind of good quality agricultural land to still sustain the, this massive demand that we now put on our land? Um, maybe did we value nature more in the past um, in terms of some of those, you know, the past kind of hunter gatherer societies? Um, and this, these kind of schematics on the right hand side, I really like these showing how different um, uh, modes of subsistence have changed over time. So we've got the hunter-gatherer society, low population densities, we had more natural ecosystems present. Um, then obviously as we kind of go through and civilizations kind of develop and we get these agrarian societies, um, then we have a, a stronger demand on the land itself. And you can see that the land, the land intensification stage is here. So we've got the green line marking intensification, then we've got involution and then we have a potential collapse. And we've seen these all throughout time, basically all throughout different societies and different civilizations. And if you go ahead to where we are, you know, are we at this tipping point now in terms of actually being able to stop this um, kind of crisis and collapse from happening? OK, and that involves a collected effort from everyone. And we're already starting to see some elements of vulnerability in the UK. Um, and this is just from um, living with environmental change report cards going back to, to 2012. That was a very, very difficult year for farmers. Um, and it was a very unusual year because it started with three um, very, very dry months. Um, and then, you know, April and summer were mostly dull, a bit of sunshine. But then April and June had some of the highest rainfall. And the summer was the second wettest in the UK wide rainfall series from 1910. Um, we've got then knock on effects in terms of what happens for our crop um, yields decreasing. Then we've got, you know, other kind of impacts in terms of them being able to sow for the autumn to prepare um, feedstocks for animals and livestock for the winter. Um, so we're already starting to see changes due to climate um, in, you know, in our own country um, and what then is actually happening um, to actually to mitigate against these. And, and this comes into a, um, an interesting notion of whether humanity actually has a safe operating space. Um, and this kind of comes from a, a risk analysis assessment um, by Stefan in 20, 2015 for this concept of planetary boundaries, for trying to see if there's a way in which we can integrate continued development of humanity, but also maintaining um, the Earth system. Um, it doesn't dictate at all how society should develop. This is just trying to identify potential risks um, and identify this safe operating space. 
Um, and you can see from this kind of diagram, you know, areas of green are safe, areas of yellow um, are increasing amounts of risk. And red is beyond zone of uncertainty, a very, very high risk. Um, and so there are kind of, you know, in terms of these kind of main boundaries, climate change and biosphere in integrity have the potential to drive our Earth system into a new state. Um, and so unless we can try and understand what's happening globally, um, as well as, you know, locally and nationally and at our own kind of garden level, um, then we need to try and, you know, we need to take some time to kind of think about that and whether we do actually have a safe operating space within the Earth system. You know, think about that. What do you think of that? Do you think that we do? Um, and this picture, again, just kind of highlights some of the changes that we might see if we did nothing in the UK. So if we just, you know, carried on with the status quo, um, potentially there'll be shifts in agriculture. So there'll be a loss of our organic soils um, on the East Coast. They would move westwards. Um, mixed and dairy farming potentially would move westwards. Um, we might see, um, you know, loss of organic soils in peatlands due to warmer and drier conditions. So they dry out, releasing more carbon dioxide and methane. Um, interestingly, this one may be not such a bad thing, uh, spread north and west of crops such as grapevines. So, you know, maybe climate change could um, be actually really good for UK wine production. Um, but the majority of these are very much negative. Um, and obviously we're an island, so things can only shift so far. So I'm aware of time, so I'll just kind of rattle through. Um, it should be another yeah, five minutes, I think, if that's all right with everyone. Um, so just to kind of try and kind of summarise a little bit then, that soils can now actually be part of the solution. Um, and there is a focus on carbon sequestration um, and how soils can actually store carbon. Um, I'm not going to go into the full details of the complexity of how um, soils store carbon, because again, it's very, very complicated. So if you just kind of focus in at the middle point of this diagram, um, SOC stands for soil organic carbon. And within that, we have different pools of carbon. So we have our active or labile pool that potentially only hangs around for, you know, it could even be hours, days, up to decades, depending on what form of carbon that might be in. And then we have other pools that uh, reside or have a residency time going up to potentially thousands, if not millennia, okay, depending on how that particular carbon has been stored within the soils. Okay, so that's why it's really, really important in terms of thinking about future sustainability and how soils are important for carbon sequestration. But then we have all of these other factors listed at the bottom, which are kind of alluded to throughout different factors that will affect the ability of our soils to sequester carbon. And again, with carbon, um, not all soils are equal when it comes to carbon. So a lot of focus is on organic carbon forms, um, but then we also have inorganic carbon forms. And so again, this diagram on the left hand side highlights this, that if you have arid conditions, dry, hot, alkaline, um, yeah, alkaline conditions, then you get a predominance of inorganic carbon that accumulates within the soil as opposed to organic carbon. And interestingly, that's also what we see in our urban soils. So we're seeing um, a dominance this time of inorganic fractions that are found. Um, and that potentially can also be useful for carbon sequestration with carbonation. Um, but, you know, and this picture at the bottom is my garden. And this was the 32 tons of rubble that we dug out of our garden. Um, over last summer or last lockdown. My boyfriend did most of it. I probably contribute about um, a ton to it. But again, this is all, relatively speaking, inorganic carbon that's just been buried. Um, but obviously it comes, you know, you can't have too much that's buried because you need to maintain that soil structure for water to be able to flow, for air to be able to reside within the soil pores and for life to be sustained. Um, this was not sustainable in terms of the amount of inorganic carbon that was in our garden. And again, another one from the FAO. Um, so this one again highlights that soils can be part of um, the key and part of the solution. So we've got all of the problems on the, the left hand side here related to potential global warming um, and climatic change. Um, and then we've also got all of these green things which are potential ways in which we can change the way that we do things on our land to try and either maintain our soil or actually improve um, the quality of our soil. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of how we can do that, but you know you can take a look at this. I'll send the slides so you can all have a look. 
Um, and just to kind of, you know, a couple of slides to end on in terms of the future soil sustainability. Um, there's quite a lot of interesting um, information that's out there in terms of how soil fits into the sustainability agenda. And um, whilst we all might think it does, um, originally soil wasn't even considered in terms of the climate action um, goal of the sustainability development goals. Um, it was only mentioned in these top four here. OK, so it wasn't even mentioned. It was only in 2015 that it was highlighted that soils actually had played a massive role in terms of cli climate action. Um, and this has just rearranged um, the, so uh, the sustainability development goals in terms of putting ecosystem services potentially at the bottom. So soils, land, water and climate underpinning all of the other different um, uh, sustainability goals. But that comes again at a cost in terms of, well, actually, how can we define soil as an ecosystem? Generally speaking, um, ecosystems will involve more the kind of biological features that are living in it or on it, you know, in terms of tundra, in terms of forests. Soils don't really kind of come under that same definition, but they are very, very complex. Um, and I've mentioned some of the, the threats that our soils are facing. And interestingly, there was a European legislation that was written up called the Soil Framework Directive. Um, but all, not all EU member states um, thought it was worthy. Um, and so eventually this just got removed from policy discussions in 2014. Um, again, so showing that actually we've got some major issues in terms of soils and communicating soils. And so there's a shift now towards, well, actually, instead of looking at, you know, potentially ecosystem services, maybe we should focus on soil functions. Um, and this potentially is a paper here by Bavi um, in 2016, and he's done another one just came out last year for looking at how um, humans can actually dictate um, in terms of what these soil services and functions are. So soils, you know, they provide nutrients to everything that lives in the soil, but it's humans that then discriminate because we're saying, oh, we don't want weeds, we don't want certain crops. You know, agriculture used to have like, um, you know, a full array of different crops that it would grow, but over time that's changed to meet human demands. So we are dictating what these soil services and functions should be. So should the focus still be on carbon storage? Um, you know, our climate forecasts are for less frequent but more intense rainfall, which would lead to food shortages, potentially to flooding, more soil erosion if our soils can't cope. So if we shift to increasing soil organic matter content to strengthen the water regulation function of soils as opposed to carbon sequestration, then people might be more able and willing to kind of get on board with it. You know, this is this is really kind of new stuff that's kind of coming out of just changing that the way in which we kind of think about what soils can provide. Um, and then, you know, yes, carbon may not be the only answer, but every little helps um, and we can do our own, you know, little things in our own gardens. You know, we're trying to talk global scale, but we can actually look at our own kind of specific garden scale as well. Um, and so these are just some examples of things that you can do in your own backyard to try and you know, sequester a little bit more carbon and improve that soil quality. Um, and then just to kind of end on, um, a major challenge is still around people's perceptions of soils. Um, people still view it as dirt. Um, you know, maybe if we change the way that we think about soils in terms of their functionality, that might help change these perceptions. And um, we know that soils are full of life, like hopefully I've kind of highlighted that enough today. But we still have lots of unanswered questions. Um, a lot of the processes are largely invisible, so people don't have a connection with soils. And there is no law to protect soils. We've got ones for water and air, but we have nothing for soils. Um, and the picture in the background is just something that hopefully will kind of resound with you, that just how much of a connection you can have with soils. And this is from, um, from the United States. Um, and each name on these jars of soil represents someone that was killed um, within the by the lynch mob um, and so they've done this set up this museum and each of these jars of soil has a story um, and it's something it's just soil in a jar with a name but it has it people have a strong connection with that um, and so if we can maybe try and change people's perceptions and change people's connections with soils then that might be part of the solution and so, yeah, just a, a quick summary, um, you know, climate is one of the main factors of soil formation, but yet climate is also one of the biggest threats. Soils we know can be part of the solution, but they need just a little bit of our help. 
Um, and, you know, people need to be more aware and concerned about what soil does. And maybe that comes through us with communicating better. Um, I was trying to find a good way to end, but the future is brown doesn't really sound very good. It's like the future is bright. Um, but in my opinion, the future is brown. It's about soils. So thank you very much. And apologies if I've overrun. Thank you so much, Helen. This is the bit that we really do lose by not being able to be in person, that we can put our digital um, applause on and I can clap to my um, <laughs> camera, but it's not the same as um, as everybody we know to sort of do a round of applause. So um, I think we've, we've got a few minutes left in the call if people don't have to dash off straight away. If people want to um, either raise a hand and ask a question, um, or if you don't want to be captured on camera, you can post a question into the meeting chat. Um, and we, we should be able to squeeze a couple of quick questions in. Um, can I ask you first, Helen, what was it that first attracted you to soils? <laughs> Do you want the honest answer? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Uh, a trip to the Arctic. Um, I yeah I didn't know anything about soils. As a geologist, soils gets in the way of the rocks, so I wasn't particularly interested in soils then. But I've always been drawn to yeah the Arctic regions. And my PhD, I was lucky enough to go up to the um, up to Svalbard and look at the soils up there. Um, so yeah, my interest yeah has, has grown over the years. <laughs> and I think I saw Hugh's hand go up. Um, Hugh, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi Helen, uh, fascinating Hello. talk, thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned um, your know, practices about uh, to keep carbon in our soil, maybe relating to our gardens, but in terms of the Keel uh, estate, do you have any you know, suggestion guides on what our grounds teams could do to improve that and more generally what we could do on the campus estates to uh, sequester carbon or at least yeah uh, i mean Keel yeah. Carbon is amazing in terms of what it has so i think um, one thing that we'd like to do is actually try and look at how much carbon is stored on Keel campus so um i don't, I don't think angie's here but we've got a, PA, a, a mass a, a dissertation student who wants to try and look at that and try and map actually what we've got on on Keel campus because <clears throat> before you can kind of say right well this is what we need to do we need to know as to what's there um, because it's not necessarily just about sequestering carbon, it's those other functionalities that the soils can provide. Um, so obviously now we've got the renewable site going in, which is amazing. Um, actually, can we maximise that, the benefits that we get from that by looking at different kind of biodiversity for different cropping regimes that might kind of go in there? Um, so as well as sequestering carbon, can we actually look at other functions that the soil can provide? So everyone is fixated on the carbon sequestration angle, um, but that's not the only thing that we can get from our potential soils. I mean, Keel, like I said, Keel is doing a really, really good job and the estates team are, are fantastic. But I think from our students' perspective, that maybe there's a bit of a disconnect and we need to try and get the students more engaged with understanding more about actually what management practices go on on campus. Um, you know, one thing that really frustrates me on campus is the leaf blower. <laughs> for many reasons but obviously removing that organic material then it's not going in back into the soils it's just being blown off elsewhere and potentially causing a problem and draining and you know blocking ditches and all that kind of stuff so there are little things that we can do and in terms of you know sealing that's another thing of actually we've got a lot of tarmac we've got a lot of concrete <laughs> um maybe there's different ways we can have a look at that in terms of you know you can get the cut the the concrete that has, I forget what you call it, but it has like lived different shapes, like hexagonal shapes. So the grass can still grow in between it, but you're still actually then having that surface that you can drive cars potentially or vehicles on. So those kind of things, I think would be something that Keel could explore um, in, in the future, I think, if that kind of answers your question. But I think Keel is doing a really, really good job, I have to say, compared, uh, compared to a lot of other universities. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Sarah had to happen didn't it uh, Alex <laughs> I think I can see your hand up <laughs> yes uh, um, well Helen thanks especially for the introduction uh, it was um, uh, quite informative I guess to go all the way from whatever <laughs> historic period you mentioned but uh, um, from what I gathered well soils are complicated as in 
chemically, physically, and biologically complicated because that's something that, you know, but there's also complex relationship between soils in, in people. But uh, being an analytical chemist, of course, my question comes from measurements, right? The maps that you showed, um, what type of quantifiable parameters were actually used to produce these maps? Because that I'm assuming uh, it's very hard to measure many of these parameters, right? And the follow-up question is, what is the demand, current demand on um, especially chemical parameters that, you know, I, I know we cannot measure everything, but uh, mm -hmm. current demand for something specific that could be possible to do and maybe improve the resolution of maps and then educate people by having more uh, precise maps if you want. Yeah, so that's I mean, maybe too vague, yeah. vague question, Bernard. Yeah, uh, I'll do my best to answer that one. It's one of the biggest problems that we have with trying to actually understand the main challenges facing our soils is the fact that we use these maps that are extrapolated based on limited data sets. Um, and they are often not based on long term monitoring. So that's something that needs to change in terms of actually monitoring our soils for longer periods of time. But unfortunately, that's then not funded by um, research councils. They don't fund kind of monitoring programs. Um, so that's a major, major problem. Um, in terms of specifically what people should measure, um, that very much depends on where you are. Um, so in you know UK context, there's a lot about um, you know potentially nitrogen and phosphorus forms. Um, actually looking at which compounds are actually important you know again lots of people measure dissolved organic carbon but that is a multitude of hundreds if not thousands of different compounds um, and there are increases in technologies for being able to look at compound specific um, chemicals that are potentially present but then it's how can we link that to these larger scale processes and it's, I, I certainly do not have the answer to that at all, because it's one of the main problems with soil science generally is soils are massively heterogeneous for a start. You know, you can take one sample a metre apart and you get completely different results because of all the external inputs and all of that life that's in the soil. Um, so and then there are other parts in the, in, the, in the world that need to have more nitrogen and phosphorus fertilisation going on because their soils are just massively degraded. But we're just still putting more and more nutrients on our soils. But I think in the UK context, this we should potentially be shifting to look at the actual the efficiency of our plants to uptake these nutrients as opposed to adding more chemicals to our soils. Whereas other parts of the world, we need to be adding more nutrients to try and help them improve that quality. So it's kind of, yeah, I definitely don't have the answer to that one because it's it's very, very it's very, very complicated. But also a lot of the measurements that are done with soils. Um, tend to focus on those that are easier to measure. So the chemical and physical parameters, for example. But what is definitely lacking, um, like I showed with the threats to biodiversity, is the detailed understanding of the biological components that contribute to, to soil quality. But yet they are the ones potentially that are going to see these changes quicker. Um, and we know that soils are massively biodiverse. What we don't know is, well, what is the functionality of them? Like there's something called um, functional redundancy. So out of all those different communities that are present, all those individual species, should we be targeting on one of them as opposed to having a look at the biodiversity kind of side of things? Should we be focusing on those that actually serve a particular function um, rather than looking at everything as a whole? So there's lots and lots of different things. I mean, it's exciting to be a part of the soil research kind of community because there's so many things that we don't know, but it would be nice if we actually knew a little bit more so we can actually try and ascertain what might happen in the future. So I know I've completely avoided really your question there, um, but it's one of the biggest challenges in terms of how we can scale up from small scale. You know, some of the stuff I did was five grams of soil in a centrifuge tube and we were scaling up to field level. So again, you know, to me, that just doesn't sit right. Like how representative is that? So we need to have the mapping and the modeling to be able to try and project into the future. But we need to have more empirical data that try and support some of these functions and identify what's actually happening. Uh, Helen, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, so Jeremy Lowe, um, do you want to unmute and, and ask your question? 
Hello, Helen. Yes, sir. Jeremy Lowe here. I'm the NFU County Advisor for Staffordshire. It's not really a question, just a, a, a comment and hopefully a bit of good news. Uh, DEFRA have just this morning um, announced the pilot measures for their sustainable farming incentive and soils uh, features quite heavily in that. And um, the arable and horticultural soil standard is to maintain and improve the condition and structure of your soil to promote clean water and improve climate resilience, biodiversity and food production. So um, things are moving in the right direction with that. And from the farming community, soils, I, I, I was thinking when I was back at college over 30 years ago, um, we were taken out with our spades to dig holes in fields and examine soil structure. And I think the soil, soil structure, organic matter has always been important. And I think sometimes the bad practice gets highlighted, but there's an awful lot of good practice that goes on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, farming just gets such a bad rep um, and it's it's it shouldn't do at all. You know, there are lots of other things that people can do themselves, you know, in terms of reducing carbon emissions, but it's easier to blame the farmers. Um, so, it's, but it's really interesting if DEFRA are now taking a more kind of active stance on that and actually looking at those functions that the soils can provide in terms of the climate change, uh, yeah, kind of climate mitigation, but also the water quality angle. And that's what I was kind of alluding to with the, that shift in focus, rather than just focusing in on why we must put loads of carbon in the soil of actually looking at these other functions that the soils offer um, and especially from yeah from the farming side of things as well and um, obviously farmers then are, are driven by um, demand um, and obviously with money and support that it's all about productivity so again if we can enhance what's happening in our soils it's going to have that knock-on effect for in improving um, productivity as well and then the knock-on effects for improving kind of water quality as well but yeah it's really I'm really glad DEFRA are doing that thank you for sharing that Fantastic. So I think we'll bring the session to a close. Thank you to everybody who's um, been able to stick along till the end. Um, Alana has put a link to the rest of our Green Festival schedule and uh, an evaluation form in the um, in the chat. And um, if you wanted to unmute yourselves and, and give a, a round of applause, please do um, <laughs> feel free to um, really want to say a big thank you, Helen, for, for delivering today's session. Really enjoyable talk and it's given us a lot of uh, food for thought. You're welcome. Sorry if it's a little bit left field. <laughs>